So maybe to get uh, the discussion started, if I may first of all thank uh, Stefano again. And um, let me ask three brief questions to all of you. I begin with uh, Joseph Tainter. Um, I mentioned it already, I think the notion of radical innovation needs some clarification. Radical innovation are those innovations like um, computers that change the way how society and the economy works. They have long-term impacts and very deep impacts, and I think it would complete the, the picture that you gave us. Um, you may think that there was no relation between the first and the second presentation, but I think I found one. When you were speaking about the list <clears throat> and all the difficulties involved um, that you described so, so well, I was wondering uh, whether this is related to not having a dynamic view. A list is something static. You have to get agreement on something that is there, what goes in it, you exclude, you include, and this creates conflict. And Joseph, at the end of your talk, you were making a reference to conflict and innovation. And I would like to you know, relate the two talks in, in this way. And Stefano, you did not mention one concept which is related to your work, namely the concept of knowledge um, integrator, aggregator. And I think this is a concept that is useful, not only from the technical point of view, but also in the wider aspect of how can you bring the tangible and the intangible uh, heritage together. Because in the end, what you want is some kind of integration. And I think uh, the concept of knowledge um, aggregator may be, may be useful. So please, I just want you to get the discussion going and then return to the audience. Joseph, you want to start? You, you raised several points. What would you like me to start on? <laughs> Uh, we have altogether only 15 minutes. All right, all right yes, yes. Your, your, your point about radical innovations <laughs> is very interesting because if, if you study the history of, of innovation, uh, much of the prosperity of the 20th century was actually based on late 19th century innovations. If you stop and think until recently, we all used cathode ray tubes. Those were invented in the 1870s. Um, and, and, and because of these innovations in, in the late 19th century, uh, our, our parents and our grandparents in the, the middle decades of the 20th century, the early to middle decades of the 20th century, uh, experienced radical changes in their lives, far more radical than anything that we've experienced. Um, pe pe people got electricity into their homes, they had light at night, they had indoor plumbing. Uh, these things are far more radical than, than a new version of the iPhone. Um, we, you know, we, 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 think, we think today that we live in an age of innovation, but in fact the innovations that we have today, uh, while many of them are, are quite disruptive, uh, are, are, are much less significant than the innovations of the late 19th to early 20th centuries. Can you say something about conflict? You know what I was yes. struck um, when I uh, listened to your presentation. Would it not, and this may be completely utopia, but what if the convention had suggested, uh, <clears throat> or what if you would have a pilot project that shows the migration, <clears throat> for instance, of the musical instruments, or the migration of other intangible heritages that cross borders, that touch on several communities, because after all, um, you know, musical instrument is a very good illustration of it, that are being used in different places. Very often they are also independently invented from the material that people find, etc. But then also they, are, they move. They are mobiles that move to other places. Would that have released some of the pressure and some of the conflict? That's what I would like to, to go. And perhaps you could reiterate what you said about conflict increase and perhaps relate it to, uh, to this particular case. Yes, yes. The point I was making in, in regard to the production of intangible cultural heritage today is that so much of it uh, exists on the internet, that this is the main way that people gain access to information, particularly younger people. And, and people 
are attracted to points of view and types of information that are consistent with what they already believe and, and that are expressed by people whom they trust and with whom they feel, feel an affiliation. And, and there is no, so we have this proliferation, this differentiation of types of information that is intangible. It exists primarily in the electronic ether. And, and yet we have a failure of complexity because this differentiation is not integrated. There is no integration to pull it together uh, in, in a constrained format. And what this means is, is that this generates uh, cultural differentiation and reinforces cultural and political uh, and economic differentiation and I think exacerbates the, the kinds of political conflict that we see in many countries today. I think it can do that. I think it can also do the opposite. Um, people do have free range to access. But one of the issues about it is, um, is the uh, credibility or the verification of information. We've got so used to now just uh, Googling something and taking it off Wikipedia or doing something that we're not checking for evidence. And one of the interesting things I think goes straight to your point is how um, people will use uh, information that's presented as an experiential anecdotal incident uh, ex thing. So I can, I can relate to a, someone who I know quite well and really like picking up um, some anti-Islamic thing which was done as a, you know, I'm an Australian who likes everybody but I went to some event and, and said X and saw X. Um, and they take that as truth because it's written in a personal sense as I, some individual that they don't even know who experienced something. So I think the experience of things is, is um, something that's really important. And we're always talking about that in heritage, is how do you get the experiential um, flavor to things? How do you make people just not see something as a building, but see it as the experience of walking through the building, for instance? It adds a dimension to it. But I think the point you're making is that we can have a whole range of fake experiences put on us. It's the same as the idea of governments using all the tools that are around, or heritage generally, as something that's nation building or, um, or um, thwarting other groups. So the problem is the complexity of information that we get. and We keep on inventing these new ways of doing it, which is even more interesting, but they're all open to distortion. So I'm not quite sure how you put order around all that distortion or whether we just accept it and look deeper. I, I'm not certain either. I don't have an answer to it. Okay. <clears throat> we don't have enough time to go into that, but Stefan, oh. you want to say a few yes, words uh, on um, the knowledge we, uh, we aggregated? We have speak, uh, I already <laughs> speak about uh, the, 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 the drawings. Uh, the drawings, yeah. uh, it, it would be meaningful. And now, especially now in the digital era, uh, we have a lot of uh, system, like uh, it was uh, for example, the maps in the 14th, 15th century, the, the aggregators of knowledge, because on, on the maps we can find all the knowledge of this, this period. But now we have new opportunities because we can to extract already, we, to put and extract. So the, the digital drawings or digital models in my, in my mind are, uh, as I have shown, in my mind are aggregator of knowledge because they can uh, be a, a sort of map of the knowledge, and we have a lot of system. We have just experimented in uh, the, the, the GIS system for storaging and uh, extracting um, data to the 2D. It exists already the GIS for the 3D, but it, it doesn't work so well. Now we have new opportunities. And uh, we, we have just experimented new opportunities, for example, in the, the drawings or architectural drawing for the design. And now the, a, the aim of uh, our work is uh, to experiment this uh, uh, storage of data in a system very complex that, like we have shown. And we have uh, some opportunities using uh, the, the, the tools that, that we have that are now available. The important is the, the, the mind of the architect as the, the, the geographer, the cartographer in the, in the antiquity that has in, in his mind the organization of the world. And it, the, now it's the architect that we have to organize this uh, 3D model to uh, collect data for example, for the restoration, but already we have seen in material data about the structure, unseen structure that are covered or, or inside. And we have how to collect and how we can extract in meaningful uh, text 
because we can extract a lot of information, but not related. So we have the problem is how to relate this information now. Okay. Uh, the floor is open. Who would like to ask question to the entire panel or to p a particular person on the panel? Yes, please. Is there a m um, another mic? It's coming. Uh, my name is Gabriel, and I'm also an Igomos member. Uh, just to, uh, it's, it's more of a question for Mr. Um, Joseph Dainter. Uh, I, I think that what have you, you've shown about innovation and uh, cultural heritage, it seems to me that you're painting something that is a model of a collapse. You know, there's a diminishing returns of sorts. But uh, cultural heritage is an evolving aspect. It's, I don't think that cultural heritage will collapse or, or uh, history will end itself. Uh, but maybe I'm seeing the relationship there of what you're mentioning on innovation and uh, mapping as a, I don't know if it's, I, I haven't really seen the connection between the three um, uh, conversations that has happened. What do you think is, how do you connect to heritage then? I, I was simply trying to give some illustrations of how complexity uh, influences the evolution, particularly the evolution of heritage. Uh, the, the examples I gave of innovation are, are modern examples, of, although they, they will influence uh, heritage in the future. But, but I, I think it's worthwhile to, to ask ourselves, uh, how did increasing costliness and diminishing returns affect innovation in the past and the production of cultural heritage in the past? I, I was struck recently there was an article that came out in, in, I think it was the New York Times, I believe last Thursday, wh where someone is, is, is attempting to demonstrate that many of the myths and stories that characterized uh, the, the Mediterranean world in antiquity and, and Europe in the Middle Ages actually originated about 6,000 years ago. Uh, in, in other words, there was very little need to innovate to, except to simply elaborate on these stories over several thousand years. That these stories are very old and, and, and there wasn't any need to innovate new stories for many thousands of years. Um, it, it, and and it, it almost seems as if uh, the, the, the production of myths and stories had reached a point of saturation where there was simply no incentive to innovate any farther. I, I don't know, this is folklore or something outside of my area of expertise. But um, I, I, what I was trying to do with the, with the three main areas that I discussed was to illustrate, uh, to, to introduce some concepts of complexity and to try to illustrate how those can be related to cultural heritage. I think this may also be partly of our Eurocentric point of view. Yes. Because if you go back to Levi Strauss, for instance, and the myths that he collected and showed, there's an enormous variety and enormous complexity, I would say. Susan. I think the other thing, mm. too, is when you talk about the production of cultural heritage, um, we're talking now in, a, in an information age where we can store that information and assuming there's no, you know, uh, apocalyptic collapse of computers, there will be a lot more information around about what people have done. I don't believe that the past, the deep past, what did lack innovation. If you're an archaeologist, you'd note that most of the things we find are stone tools. You had some pictures of stone tools because they survive in the archaeological record. That doesn't mean that was the sum total of people's innovation. Their innovation would have been cultural and social and uh, their innovation would have used wood and feather and a whole range of things which have now gone. So I think, and, and with language and stories, we, you know, there's some fantastic work done, but also I don't think that what we have left, we can say is the sum total of the creativity that was around with people um, in that deep time. We've just got to a point now where there's so much of the information and we will have so much that's collected and we're able to manage and store it, uh, which, you know, obviously people in the Neolithic didn't have. Um, so I don't think I really agree that people, we've just suddenly innovated now and that people weren't innovative before. Uh, perhaps it's more of a evolving rather than <laughs> collapsing, I think. I, I would Stephanie. like to, add, to yes. underline that uh, we are now already producing cultural heritage. So we have to take care already of our uh, situation. <laughs> and uh, I propose uh, at the end of my conference, I, I told that the preservation of the digital data is one of the most important problems that we have now. Because since uh, we have the paper, we preserve everything with the paper. But now it's a, it's a problem, so we have to solve. It's, it's, a, it's not a, 
uh, new problem, but we well, have to think. We, we, we have to think. Okay, one more question. Yes. Um. <clears throat> You give it to the lady, or I don't know. <laughs> I really sympathize, Professor Joseph, with your depression about this, and I wonder. I you you I you have an amazing bibliography of books that you've written about um, biofuels and energy and all of all of that. And um, we had a conference here last spring with Sander Vanderloo, who I think you must have worked with in Arizona. And Sander gave two, he's an archeologist and anthropologist, and he gave two back-to-back -back lectures. And the first, that had to do with innovation. So the first lecture was showing um, his earlier research from 30, 40 years ago with, with um, instead of looking at innovation in terms of looking at a pot as innovative, he looked at all the different tasks that had been gone into the pot in terms of brain function. And he correlated the, um, the number of, bra of steps of the brain with sustainable survival of certain ancient cultures in Syria. So he gave sort of one standard talk about that research that had led to the idea of innovation, and he kind of coined that term. Then he gave a second talk about the end of innovation, and it, basically a similar talk to you, but he was saying a little differently that, that brain function, that we didn't, we no longer, our brains could no longer compute the results of what we were doing. We weren't capable of following through with the, um, you know, the, the feedback loops and everything else. So he's now doing a project in China where, I don't, he's a little nervous about this, but it has to do with um, working with in a development of a community in China without technology. Now, I don't think, so I, I don't, my question for you is, there, there's a lot of material that, I mean, that might be one hopeful step, but I think I'm sort of more with Helga, that there may be less radical ways of um, working, working with ideas of innovation and um, sort of self-containment. Self so I just thought I'd ask you, I mean, I kind of offer you that information and then I just ask about your state of mind at this, at this present point when you're looking at all the kind of biofuels and I mean, that bibliography is, is very impressive. Let, okay. Short answer, please. <laughs> let, 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 me, let me talk about why I've been doing innovation studies. It, it's because of sustainability. Uh, conventional economists argue that we don't need to worry about resources. That as resources are never scarce, they're just priced wrong. That as long as we have a price, a, a, a price mechanism, um, that, that uh, scarcity will always bring forth innovations. My argument has been, yes, that has been true to the present time. We're all here and we all live fairly well. Um, the problem is that it assumes, and economists don't realize this, it assumes that the productivity of innovation will be constant into the future. And that is why I've been studying the productivity of innovation. Because what we're showing is that the productivity of innovation, in fact, is declining. Uh, Sondra is an old friend of mine. I've known Sondra for many years, and, and I know of his very fine research on, on innovation in, uh, in, in, in pottery production and, and in other areas. Um, this is something Sandra and I have actually never discussed, um, but I look forward to having the chance to someday. But it's, it, this, th this strikes me as the fundamental question of sustainability. Will we always be able to innovate our way out of resource shortages? Um, I, I am a little pessimistic about that for the long-term future. For the short-term, yes. For the long-term, I have my doubts. Susan, and then we have to finish. <clears throat> One quick question for you. I'm just wondering, one of the counterpoints, and maybe it occurred in some people's minds, to in, in um, your, the technology you're using and the, virtual, the recording of virtual heritage in a way, um, I wonder if you see any dangers in it. I know that in Sydney, in Australia at the moment, one of the things that the uh, regulating authorities are doing, every time they can't save something, they're now saying, they now say, sorry, you have to do a 3D scan of it and then they destroy it. Are you worried at all, um, as a heritage person, that in fact this technology will be used in this way um, as, as a way of the engineers and the developers and all of the people saying, you don't need to keep it, we can virtually keep it for you. We can have this perfect example and you can even walk through it and it, experience it. It, it, it becomes a surrogate, it becomes a surrogate. Yes. The, the original one, it, it's important already. It, it, it 
it's very important to take care of the original life. But you have seen what happened now. Uh, there will some part of our heritage is in the for many reasons. No, no, we have not a common politics, we have not a common way of understanding. We have not a common way of understanding of uh, culture and uh, we have not a common way of understanding of uh, conservation because we have uh, in Italy one, one way of thinking and another way. So it, the, 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 the structure itself, it changed. We can conserve it. One moment, it's like a picture, one moment of this. But it's, for me it's very useful to have this moment and to have this data for the future, because we, we don't know what happens. But it doesn't mean that we have the, the new one. <laughs> we prefer yeah. the old one, <laughs> so it's important. Okay. Sorry, we have to close. I would just like uh, to add um, one thought to the discussion we had here, since um, innovation was brought in by, by Joseph. Normally, when you use the term innovation, people think of technical, technological innovation. And yet, there is a very important part of human activities which consists in social innovation. And I think we have to add this to the much too narrow view of innovation as being only technological. And I would add to this, the more technological innovation we have, in order to cope with the complexity, the more social innovation we need. But now we have lunch, good continuation of the discussion over lunch, and we will be back here at, um, in one hour's time. Um, yes? Which means we are back at quarter two, at two o'clock? At two o'clock, okay. So the first session is closed, thank you.